Thank you. Hello. Oh, man. So good afternoon, Verge 23. It is so wonderful to be here in beautiful San Jose. And I want to give my appreciation to the Ohlone sisters, because if we don't acknowledge those folks that were here before us, taking care of the land before us, then my goodness, we're in trouble. So thank you, Ohlone sisters, for acknowledging the original stewards of this earth. So when I think about environmental justice, for me, it involves three cornerstones, people, policy, and practice. And the way that we interweave those together can really help us achieve that just, healthy, sustainable world that we all deserve. And when I think about environmental justice, before I dig in, I want to ask you a question. And I don't know if I'll be able to see hands in this room, but raise your hand if you know what environmental justice is. OK. Thank you for the house lights. I see a couple. Awesome. So for those hands that I didn't see raised, I want you to visualize with me a world where you can step out of your front door, breathe clean air, and not experience the taste of sulfur or particulate matter in your mouth. I want you to imagine being able to send your babies to school and not be afraid that just from drinking out of the water fountain that they're going to be drinking water contaminated with lead. I want you to think about the opportunity to provide clean school buses and clean transportation in all communities across this country. I want you to think about being able to afford and access fresh fruits and vegetables for your family. Again. That's not hard to imagine, but that reality is not something that everybody experiences. So when we think about the opportunity to imagine environmental justice, a place where the color of your skin, your ethnicity, how much you make at the end of the year, what zip code you live in, that, that doesn't have to dictate whether you have a healthy or sustainable community or not. That is what environmental justice is. And I'm proud to be a part of an administration that has made that a core ambition with the leadership and support of President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. So the reason I'm up here is because I'm excited to be a part of this administration. But I also have some personal connections and I call it my why I do this work. We know, and hopefully you know, and if not, you'll know after this, that unfortunately we have black and brown communities, indigenous communities, low-income communities that unfortunately continue to be hit the first and worst and are the least and last to recover after climate extremes. The fact that I have family and friends and strangers that have been negatively impacted by climate change, it makes my why even more important. My grandparents on the screen suffered from extreme heat stress by living in their homes. And they weren't the only seniors on De in Detroit dealing with heat stress. Our houseless folks, so many others. My parents on the east side of Detroit unfortunately were displaced from their home five times because of extreme rain and flooding driven by climate change. And I don't know how many of you have gone through something where you've been displaced from your home, but it's traumatic. You lose things that you can't replace, and you have a fear that comes in every time it rains. So my why is connected not only to this administration, but to the people I know and the people I don't know. So I have this awesome privilege to be the first ever federal chief environmental justice officer for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. <laughs> and I don't take that lightly. And for those of you that may not know 
the Council on Environmental Quality, or CEQ. Don't be mad, I didn't know either before I started working there. But our role and our mission is to improve, protect, and preserve public health and the environment and coordinate the federal government to do that. So when I think about the importance of just this April, our president signing a new environmental justice executive order, revitalizing our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all, that builds on the foundation of our first EO, but it works to embed even more this, this notion of environmental justice into all federal agencies. That's important. But even his first week in office, President Biden signed another executive order, 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad that set in motion the most ambitious climate and environmental justice agenda ever, starting multiple initiatives, one of those being the Justice 40 initiative. So if you don't know what the Justice 40 initiative is, it is our goal to make sure that 40% of the overall benefits of investments of federal resources make it to communities that have been marginalized, overpolluted, underinvested, and I'm, in my words, forgotten. We're trying to do this by investing in clean energy, safe and affordable housing, energy efficiency, all those core pieces. And we're doing this by redesigning and transforming current government programs, over 470 of them and counting. I'm going to talk about a couple of those Justice 40 programs that you might be familiar with, and one being the NEVI program, with the goal, again, of getting 500,000 public charging stations across this country. The second one is from our Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is focused on tackling natural disasters and climate before they happen and getting our communities prepared so they can be more resilient. Now, you might ask, how do we know where these communities that are overpolluted, marginalized, underinvested in are? Well, we got a tool for that. And I know I'm in a tech audience. So pull out your phones and Google Climate Economic Justice Screening Tool. This is a tool that again, the president asked us to create, that is a geospatial mapping tool that identifies those census tracts that are considered disadvantaged. The cool part is that our federal agencies are able to use this tool to make sure that these resources get to the communities that need them. I talked a little bit about the tool, but what's most important is the people. And we are fortunate to have a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, or WEJAC, which is composed of presidentially appointed environmental justice leaders that touch every corner of this nation. They provide us with advice and formal recommendations. They help us do our job in advancing policy by making sure we pull community voice into all of our solutions. Now, we got the people and the tools, but you know we need the policy. And if you haven't heard, <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, one of the largest and first pieces of climate legislation in history, $369 billion, has set forth in a big way our opportunity to tackle the climate crisis, to lower costs for Americans related to energy, and many other things. And of course, there's many Justice 40 programs that are funded by the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, I'll talk about one, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, leveraging over $27 billion of private capital to, again, tackle the climate crisis. And this is a program that's being run by our friends at the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, and they're doing a great job to make sure, again, that this Justice 40 program prioritize those communities that have been left behind. So I'm talking about all this, policy, people, tools, but we need to make sure that the practice happens. And so as I think about the folks in this room, all y'all are smart people, I don't even know you, but I know you're smart, I know you're savvy, I know you're connected, I know you have power and privilege, which we all do. And so I want to encourage you to go back to your workplaces and ask the question, 
how can I advance environmental justice in what I do? And so I have three simple questions that I've taken with me throughout my life that I want to leave with you today. The first, who is going to benefit from my policy decision or my decision to invest in a technology? Who will be the benefactors? Ask that question. The second, have I been inclusive? Have I talked to folks that maybe I've never talked to before? Have I made some new friends, as I tell my daughters? Have I been inclusive in my conversations to inform my policy decision or my investment? And last but not least, are there any unintentional consequences, both negative and positive, that might come from this policy decision? Again, keep those three questions in your back pocket, and I guarantee you will be one step closer to advancing environmental justice. So as we think about this administration, we are blessed to have policy, <laughs> We are blessed to have resources, and we are blessed to have practitioners that want to achieve that North Star of environmental justice. And particularly as it relates to climate, and I can't not say this on the stage, we released a national climate resilience framework a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, check it out. But all these pieces, again, crouched in the sentiment of people, policy, and practice will help us advance environmental justice. I believe that. And so as you think about the little bit of my story I shared with you, and as you continue to create your own story, I want you to remember that we can create a legacy that we can all be proud of. So thank you for what you do, thank you for what you're gonna do, and have a wonderful Verge 23 conference.